Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and what comes to mind when you hear of rain? Nuclear bombs? No, because that's exactly what we're going to be talking about. Today I wanted to discuss this new research that just came out that actually suggests there was a connection between the amount of nuclear tests in the atmosphere and the amount of rain that was generated as a result. Let's talk about this and welcome to What The Math. As you probably already know, in the 1960s and also a little bit before that and of course a little bit after that as well, there were quite a lot of different nuclear tests by the USSR and the United States and a few other countries joined in a little bit later as well. Some of these tests, like this one right here, were atmospheric. Essentially the bomb when it exploded created a large amount of debris and a large amount of radiation in the atmosphere and a lot of ionizing radiation that then spread across the entire planet. And back then, by studying the circulation of the atmospheric radiation across the planet, the scientists actually had a really good chance to study how atmosphere circulated the air around the planet and how various atmospheric conditions were formed and propagated through the atmosphere. But the study that very recently came out used this old data to discover something else we actually did not know about. And even though we knew it theoretically, we just never suspected it to actually happen. In this paper, the scientists discovered that that same radiation, the ionizing radiation produced by the nuclear bombs, also resulted in the significantly higher chance of precipitation, rain. And a chance of having a rainy day on the day when the nuclear test was conducted, or at least a few days after the nuclear test was conducted, on average was about 24% higher. Basically, all of these nuclear tests in the 60s created a lot of rainy days in the atmosphere of the planet. But the thing is, it wasn't really super dangerous rain, radioactive rain, or rain that would have killed everyone, it was just regular rain. And this is where th things get really scientific and actually kind of interesting. First of all, to discover a lot of this, the scientists used the data from a relatively remote location in the United Kingdom. Right here, um, north of Scotland, there's a city called Lurwick. Although I'm sure I mispronounced that, so if you are Scottish, my apologies to you, sir or madam. So Lurwick is somewhere right here, and there is an observatory here that collected a lot of various data over the years. And by using the data from this really remote location, the scientists were able to very precisely estimate the amount of rain and also the amount of atmospheric radiation during the period of atomic tests. So essentially, um, the discovery itself suggests that uh, during the atomic tests, the cloud layer was much, much thicker than normal, also about 20 to 30 percent thicker, and at the same time, the amount of rain um, happening around the planet was also much higher. But they only got to measure the rain in the United Kingdom. But what exactly is happening here? Well, the science of what's happening is related to basically what the um, radioactive compounds do in the atmosphere. They obviously produce a lot of ionizing radiation, basically radiation that we normally consider to be dangerous. So this could be x-rays, gamma rays, and so on. And right here, it's quite obvious that it was much higher during the 60s. And during that time, that ionizing radiation created a lot of highly electrical conditions in the actual atmosphere. That radiation electrified the atmosphere, thus allowing for more clouds to form and for more rain to form. So it wasn't really the dangerous type of rain, because the actual um, radioactive matter was still up there in the atmosphere, but the creation of the clouds was influenced and encouraged by the little particles, radioactive particles in the atmosphere, that basically then electrified the atmosphere to the point where a lot more clouds and a lot more rain were produced over time. And all of this was actually happening thousands and thousands of miles away from the actual tests. So even though tests may have occurred in the deserts of the United States, even the United Kingdom was experiencing more rain. And one of the ways that this could be happening is by having the electrical charge itself modify how the water droplets collide with one another, thus affecting the size of the droplet and then changing the amount of clouds that form as a result and the rain that is then formed from the clouds. Although right now the how part is still a little bit theoretical because we can't just look into the clouds and try to discover how they form the actual rain. However, the theoretical prediction is kind of solid. So only the further experiments may allow us to actually conclude if it's a fact or just a speculation. And obviously, as soon as the atomic tests stopped completely, 
Within only a few months, the actual rain formation dropped down to the original levels before the test began. So there's also that confirmation as well. Basically, it is a correlation, but the correlation here is strong enough to assume that the atomic bombs did actually increase the chance of rain formation. But why would that be important today? Well, it's not really about the atomic bombs, as a matter of fact, as you can probably tell in the last few years, you probably didn't really hear anything about atomic bombs at all. Our priorities have changed. Back then we were afraid of the atomic war, today we're more concerned with climate. And more specifically, of course, with either things like droughts or other unusual phenomena or climatic changes that might affect our planet due to all of the global warming that unfortunately we have been kind of causing. So today there are quite a lot of different countries doing a lot of research on, well, you can kind of call it climate control. And one of the areas currently studying um, the so-called rain control is actually in Middle East. I'm going to try to find it somewhere right here in the United Arab Emirates. There are actually uh, several different teams trying to investigate the best way to control rain. And this is kind of where this research is coming from. As a matter of fact, one of the more recent papers coming out of the same country is essentially related to the idea of being able to produce certain crops that are able to grow in a desert. Like for example, they've recently investigated the ability to plant rice here, and at least one team was able to successfully find a way to grow rice in a desert, they just need to have a little bit more water. And this is of course where the whole idea of rain and controlling rain comes into play. What the scientists suggest here is that by finding a way to somehow electrify the atmosphere, we can find a very efficient way to produce more clouds and to produce more rain in locations where rain is not very common, such as of course deserts. And producing rain in the desert and being able to actually uh, control rain in other regions is definitely something that a lot of uh, different countries around the world would love to take advantage of. I'll give you an example from the country where I currently am. In South Korea, one of the biggest problems right now is pollution. And pollution that's airborne. Now, I don't want to point fingers here, but most of it is unfortunately coming from the westerly neighbor, the neighbor being China, of course, that decided to uh, put a lot of different factories right here on the east coast that are unfortunately spewing out a lot of pollution toward Korea. Now, one of the solutions proposed by the president of Korea last year was to find a way to generate rain. They actually previously suggested trying to spray some sort of an aerosol, for example, into the atmosphere to help raindrops being generated, but so far this is all theoretical and none of this unfortunately worked. And one of the reasons why rain would actually help here is because rain does trap pollution and um, sort of clears the atmosphere, preventing air pollution from basically ever reaching Korea in general. And this is something that um, has been a problem here for a few years now. And so essentially by spraying different aerosols in this location, Korea was kind of trying to find a way to get rid of the pollution, but so far has not been successful. However, if this study is correct and if we can also find a way to somehow effectively electrify the atmosphere using possibly some sort of a chemical reaction, once again by spraying something there, obviously something safe, we could potentially find a way to very effectively generate a lot of clouds, a lot of rain clouds, and thus a lot of rain. And you know, rain control or weather control has actually been a theme or a topic in many different science fiction movies and different science fiction books, so it's a little bit surprising that we still haven't figured out how to do it. Although maybe, we just have. So now we just have to find a technique to easily electrify the atmosphere. Now it's obviously going to be a while before we successfully discover a technique that will allow us to very efficiently do this, but the idea, the theoretical idea is there, and it does seem to have quite a lot of solid foundation behind it. And obviously we don't know which country is going to be first at doing this, but whoever does it is probably going to create a completely new industry of what's known as geoengineering research. The ability to engineer various geological and atmospheric conditions here on the planet. And if we were successful one day, well, there's no telling how much we'll be able to achieve by being able to create rain at will. Because it's not really just about growing food or providing water for plants, it's also about being able to clean the atmosphere and possibly even cool the atmosphere if needed. So here the possibilities are limitless. But this is why I thought this was a pretty interesting research to mention, and we'll definitely come back and talk a little bit more about the discoveries related to this particular study. 
But until then, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe consider supporting this channel Patreon, and maybe support this channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that you can also find in the description below. On that note, I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye.